Okay, folks. Let's just uh, summarize that. So. <coughs> okay. Yeah. I'm very happy with all the people that have paid something. It's lovely. Uh, anybody who wants to pay a bit next week, uh, I'm, I'll be happy to uh, have the first install, the first half this week, next week. And yeah, if you're pushed for money, do ask. But yeah, the balance, if you've paid 50 quid this week, um, I'd be asking for another 50 quid by midway, halfway through the course. So that's to stri- stagger it out. Has everyone tried some of the greens? Mm. They've gone down well. That's good. Right. We'll do lights in a bit, yeah. Not now. Not now. <laughs> so, if we can have a look at the booklet, I'm just going to go through a couple of these sheets. Hmm. And, yeah, part of the explanation for the booklet is when I first did a course, I'd written up some A4 sheets of information to supplement that. And actually what happened was so many people who asked me certain questions, like about pests and diseases or compost, that after I'd answered them about 100, 100 different people on the same subject, I thought, I may as well write it down and have some notes. So I developed over the years a set of sheets, mostly in kind of simple A4 format, uh, which would then answer their questions with it, without me having to go through it all again. So for, this, for the first few course, courses that I taught, I'd be giving out uh, a few sheets per session, uh, but I've honed them down and bundled them up and put them into what I think is a sensible order to deliver a whole course of ten sessions. And so you've got the kind of result of years of kind of tweaking and editing and fiddling. They do make quite a lot of sense if you just look through them as a book, but not as much sense as when we actually discuss them and go through them in class. Uh, The recommendation would be to actually just spend a little bit of time familiarising yourself with what's in the booklet uh, this week, next week. And then if if you can have the time to read up on the next session, so it's all in chronological order, uh, there's a couple of bits which are out of sequence, which are the uh, how a plant grows, which is on the end, which I'm very proud of. A botanical illustrator did the illustrations for that. And just inside the front, uh, the, the back cover, that's a lunar planting calendar, which, yeah, you can, again, have a look at it. It does make sense. We'll go through it in greater detail in about session four, I think. Um, so, yeah, have a look at it now. Uh, in the near future. Try and recap before each session if you can, that would help. And, yeah, having had a few previous students tell me that they've kept their little booklet as a general reference. It's just the right size to kind of slip in your pocket, you can take it out with you. And some of the key concepts in here you won't find in other source material. So uh, we're a bit awash with media in the modern world. And we've got all the kind of, yeah, like I say, people who think they're experts. Um, I've read most of the kind of literature that's been around in the last 20 years. And actually, some of the best literature comes from 40, 50 years ago. Some of the old Soil Association books still stand up. Um, but yeah, this is not supplementary, but it's trying to go and delve down and get some of the key concepts that inform us and set us up for the different practices involved. So it is of, it is of value, um, and like I say, it's been checked out not just by lots of students, but uh, maybe you know, people who have come along to the projects I work on. Uh, I don't have to show them the book, I can just show them the practice, and I think, oh, that makes sense. And yeah, there's a thing about if a, a technique is both beautiful and productive, aesthetic and functional, then it, it probably is the right way to do things. Having said that, Plants will just survive, and it's amazing how you can just throw things in, and they will grow. But it's trying to do it consciously, so you know what you're doing, and being more methodical about it. That's not to take away the joy of kind of spontaneity, 
But if you've got the underlying concept behind what you're doing, it all makes more sense and is more purposive, that kind of thing. So just looking at the first couple of pages, page three and four, that was just going for this definition of organic, which is around living, animate, natural, biotic. Um, and that's a better way than, descri- than describing it in a, a negative definition of avoiding all the chemicals and avoiding machinery as much as possible and avoiding the use of fossil fuels. But we might have that as a parallel definition. The hundred forms of garden, like I say, uh, that was really around the frustration that people would call me a gardener. And some of these gardens I approve of and enjoy and would like herb gardens and monastic gardens and food gardens. But uh, the world of gardening, it's a bit like classical music. My dad does classical music, but I haven't got... My life isn't long enough to learn all the different authors and uh, uh, composers and Schubert's and all that kind of thing. So that's just... There's an overwhelming number of different types of garden. Um, And again, the food garden, uh, I'm I'm just defining as something different from what we traditionally think of as garden. And then at the bottom of that, uh, yeah, listing all the different names, and there are more from around the world, for a productive space. So... Allotment and plot, plot's the Anglo-Saxon allotment, that sounds a bit kind of Frenchified. But potager, that's a, a small, Fre- French, a French word for a small uh, productive garden. Dacha, that's like an allotment in Russia, where you actually move there in the summer, and you stay there, and you live there. So it's uh, like a second home almost. Uh, and yeah, a couple of years, no, yeah, a couple of years ago now, Mr Putin told the Russian peasants to start growing potatoes. Now, they grow potatoes when times are bad and they've got to guarantee their own self-sufficiency. If times are good, uh, they grow grain and they sell it onto the market and they make money. But the most recent advice is just to make sure you look after yourselves and don't expect too much from the rest of the world and uh, grow potatoes. Uh, And then, yeah, orchard, orchard, that that goes back. Uh, So that's got a kind of bit of history. And, yeah, main thing to be aware of, and to try and avoid as much as possible what I've termed the TV checkbook hit and run makeover garden, as illustrated by the Titchmarsh kind of makeover syndrome where they go in, whack it one day, and then go away and never see it again. Uh, Alongside, yeah, I've got a colleague who's a bit of a landscape at uh, Sheffield University, and in the last ten years we've had a bit of a, a plague of chippers and little buzzy machines that go around and take things down. But maybe don't do a permanent job. The pro- proposition is, the suggestion is that, yeah, landscapers who come in and whack things back, well, that just causes the plants to regrow even more vigorously, and then you have to have your landscapers back another several times regularly. So they're both basically making money, of, well, making more work for themselves into the future. So it's rather than think about just taking the surface, doing the surface job, a cosmetic job with a machine, uh, thinking you're going to do a, a full job, maybe by hand, might take longer, but it might last for much longer. And that's illustrated by some of the allotments, like Ed there has taken an allotment that was basically a woodland. And he's still in the process of grubbing out the roots of the trees a couple of years later. For, <laughs> but just whacking it with a machine. I mean, you looked into machines... None of them are going to do the proper job. We've got to do it by hand, and that takes longer, but then it's going to last, and also you get bonded with the the land that way. So that's just a bit of uh, kind of vague thinking. Now, the spectra and polarities chart, again, evolved over quite a long period, and the fundamental here is, rather than thinking in black and white, good and bad, positive and negative, uh, none of these... None of that way of thinking really applies in nature. It's all somewhere on a spectrum. So even though I've devoted my life to organics for the last 20 years, I must confess that I've got this Land Rover now, and I put uh, fuel into it, and I feel terrible about it, but I don't go very far. But I do you know, sin and use petrol, but not very much. And that's, I, don't, I don't use machinery, so it's not a, a, a terrible... So that's accepting that... Even though I'm, I'm kind of virtuous in one sense, I'm not free of the problems of modern society in that sense. So it's a bit like, yeah, we're trying to 
direct ourselves towards this left column of more virtuous things and away from the right column of things that we disapprove of or uh, we've found to have problems to them. But yeah, that, that definition of organic practice as what works in the longer term. So rather than thinking you've done a job that lasts for a couple of months, what's going to resolve the problem, what's going to work as a functioning technique long term? And that's very much illustrated by fruit planting. If we plant the fruit well, we don't need to do very much, and it'll thrive, and we can come back and get the crop later. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, a, a collaborative process. It's not just my, my comparisons. We'll all have the same kind of uh, divisions in our mind, but rather than thinking of them as black and white and good and bad, uh, we're trying to get better, and we're trying to get you know, whiter, but we might never actually get to the point of being perfect or good. So that's just informing our underlying thinking about ha what practices we adopt. So, for instance, I condemn, and I don't like, impermeable black plastic used as a mulch on top of the soil, because that's stopping the soil breathing, it's stopping rain getting into the soil and natural processes happening. However, I do have a deep love of polytunnels, which are essentially the same thing, but I can grow underneath the polytunnel. Yeah, it's still using plastic, but uh, in, the, in the case of a polytunnel, I might get five to ten years' use out of a piece of plastic, and I'm getting crops all the time. If it's black plastic used as a mulch, it goes down, it gets for forgotten about, it breaks up and becomes a waste problem later on, and it's fundamentally not good for the soil or the plants that are supposed to be growing around it. So, again, that's based on a bit of experience. Um, so, is that okay as a proposition, just to... Uh, yeah, I think the Chinese have a bit more of a, a kind of circular way of thinking. So rather than thinking left, right, up and down, good, bad, uh, they think they know that everything's on a on a, a circle or a spectrum, that kind of thing. So it's just to avoid extreme thinking. And the next four pages are devoted to a kind of brief introduction. And I'm going to have about five minutes to summarise this. Please. Just read through these again at a later date, but um, yeah, just introducing some of the basic concepts that we're going to be using through the course and are very useful anyway. This actually is something that I wrote uh, nearly 20 years ago now as a little introduction for myself and to pass on to others. So this was kind of core building block of uh, what's turned into a bit more of a book now. But yeah, uh, biodynamics, thinking about recycling and retaining. Uh, fertility within a system. And using that word system might be a bit of a, an onslaught because it's just a garden or it's just a few pots or it's an allotment. But once you've got the concepts of the techniques involved, uh, it is a growing system. And when you use it year on year uh, and you actually get food from it and it's productive, trying to see the systems that are in action uh, in what you think of to begin with as just a natural phenomenon. Um, the composting bit, if we introduce the concept of the four elements, earth, air, fire and water, that's very useful for com compost. And in that sense, that gives us a, a clue about we're trying to get um, a midpoint between the extremes. So between fire and water, we don't want it to get too hot, but we want it warm. And we, don't, we want it moist, but we don't want it drenched. So it's trying to get uh, a, a concept of the extremes and if we can keep our com compost within the midpoint rather than the extreme. But yeah, compost would illustrate that it heats up, then it needs to breathe in oxygen to carry on heating. If we don't keep moisture in the compost and it dries out, it stops working. And finally, at the end of the process, we should have formed something which is more like soil or humus at the end of the process. Uh, another definition is the combination of carbon and nitrogen materials, which is also explained in terms of brown and green materials going into compost. So initially we want quite a lot of green stuff, which could be old crop waste, uh, or potent stuff in nitrogen, which could be manure, uh, and that will complement the carbon or woody materials that we've got, which could be uh, woody clippings, or it could be bits of uh, carbon in the form of cardboard, something like that. Uh, I'll go into compost and show you more illustrations of that later on. Those are the kind of key concepts. And the 
organisms, again at the heart of organic thinking, feeding organisms, microorganisms in the soil, and also macroorganisms. Uh, if you go right down to the smallest level, there are literally billions in just a teaspoonful, billions of bacteria in a healthy soil. So it's trying to anticipate that. And yeah, my parallel for that is they've just come up with computers which do terabytes of information. So you've got kilobytes, megabytes, what's the next one? Terabytes. But soil, there are billions of organisms in soil, so when it rains, there are billions of processes going on and bits of information being transferred. And that's my analogy that soil is actually more clever than computers. Mm. Anyway, that's just me. <laughs> Raised beds, once you have used a site for more than six months, for a year or two, uh, you realise that it's worth laying it out, improving your paths, and then consolidating your soil and not treading on your soil. The old process with allotments was essentially they were all one big raised bed and the soil wasn't trampled down too much. But especially where I've got sites where I have visitors and volunteers coming on, uh, if I can direct them in the right direction and get them to walk on a path instead of over the soil, then I'm protecting my soil. And soil compaction, too much weight on the soil, would be one of the worst things for it. Illustrated by, in Rivlin Valley, uh, the whole valley was beautifully laid out with wonderful drainage systems, which took a lot of effort to put in. And then they've had horses grazing on them for the last 20 years. The horses compact the soil, they crush the drainage system, so they've ruined the land drains. And seriously, in terms of big cultivation farming, draining your land has got to be a key priority. If you haven't got drained land, your plants are going to just die in the soil if you get too much water. So that's a kind of precursor. But yeah, thinking about, we're going to raise beds a bit more. Mulching and green manuring, both of, way, both of which are ways to protect the soil. And that's partly illustrated by nature abhors a vacuum and doesn't want bare soil. If you leave bare soil, as soon as you start to dig your soil and remove the weeds and leave the soil, but well, if you get a real hard, big downpour torrent of rain, your soil is going to wash away. If, especially if, on, like around here, a lot of us have got a slope. And yeah, I did have one case with a student from four years ago. He'd dug up the allotment and put a lot of hard work in, and then the big rain came, and literally about 10 tonnes of soil washed down the plot, and half of it was washed away. So as soon as you open up the soil, it's your responsibility to protect it and look after it and stop it being leached away and washed away. That can happen in the sun, but the rain would be the worst. Uh, companion planting and crop rotation, again, once we're undertaking to look after a piece of soil and become its guardian for several years into the future, then, again, we want to mix together combinations of plants which are going to thrive. And companion planting, it can be as simple as thinking that two plants that crop at different times of the year <coughs> will make good companions. If you've got a tall plant and a short plant, they'll grow together relatively well. And the same below ground, if we think about a deep-rooting, tap-rooted plant, or a perennial like a fruit tree, combined with a shallow-rooting plant, they're going to use different parts of the soil. So if you know, the more you know about uh, what plants exploit and use which bits of the soil at different times, the more you're going to be able to combine successfully different crops. But again, like with the point about simplicity leads on to complexity, as soon as you've got more than about three types of plant, they can go together in about 20 combinations, so it can be complicated. Like five, if you've got five different plants, you can get them growing in 16 different combinations. Whatever. So it, it can be complicated. But again, there are principles underlying which we can follow. Uh, and each of our own sites, and also our own growing, will have different tricks and find that different things work. Looking at your neighbours, seeing what people have done before, that's really good advice, and asking what thrives on particular soils. Uh, yeah, when I was doing the large kitchen garden at Unstone Grange, which took 10 years to recover, we found that celeriac grew really well there. And there was a carryover, I think it was potash, that was in the soil. So there we could grow great big celeriacs, specifically. Uh, and if we'd known the right person to ask, we could have found it out much earlier. Uh, plant care and cyclic synchronicity, that's... Uh, 
yeah, let's just say uh, I've got this concept that all that we're talking about is actually science. And I do know scientists who write off organic growing as if it wasn't part of science. But of course it is. It's just a bit more complicated than what they do in a test tube in a, in a laboratory. So, yeah, this, this concept of the proposition of subtle science. There are some things which our brains are clever enough to appreciate. We can notice little changes and little tweaks and little things which you couldn't necessarily predict. So, again, our brains, in some ways, are superior to computers still, and we can notice certain things going on which the scientists can't measure. And because they can't measure it, they say it doesn't exist. But we can see, with our eyes and our senses, that changes are happening and little subtle variations going on. So, yeah, the plant care aspect of biodynamic preparations, we can see that there's an improvement in growth but we can't necessarily measure it, or can't, the scientists can't measure it, that kind of thing. And next couple of sheets, have a little read through that, but that is very much more laid back and philosophical, and also they, they're founded upon just looking and observing and appreciating a site can be really valuable and informative and help you in your growing. So actually by sitting around and just watching stuff, you might be able to save time in the longer run. <laughs> Uh, if you've got, you know, it, that's kind of get something growing first, so you've got something to look at. But also, yeah, there's a, a recommendation there that if you're starting on a new site, especially if it's, if it's a large site, there is a recommendation to just sit and watch it and observe it and see what's going on for a whole growing season before you get on and actually grow it, grow, in, grow on it. And that could delay you a lot. But I've seen a lot of people rush ahead and trying to do the wrong thing or impose an idea that they've had on a ground as if it's a clean sheet of paper and not taking into account major things like drainage or where the stream comes in the winter or what the quality of the soil is like. So you could waste a lot of time and energy and your motivation and your hopes for the future, whereas actually taking it a lot slower, sometimes the tortoise does win against the hare kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. Right. And just to conclude, last quarter of an hour this evening. I'd like to show you some slides. But that does mean... Can we have the lights out, Ed? Sorry to interrupt you. Ed, Ed's researching. He's doing his fourth degree. I think it's his fourth one. So he is here, but he's also uh, slightly preoccupied. Uh, especially that one. Sorry. <coughs> and let's see if that lights up in a minute. Yeah, the slides... Uh, they do make sense. It's a shame that I haven't got loads and loads of videos to show you. But then I could just put the videos on and walk out. Uh, but yeah, the slides, I mix them together in different uh, orders. They're gathered from maybe, yeah, ten, ten years, last ten years since I've been taking lots of digital slides. And yeah, these ones are to illustrate partly a kind of inspirational half, first half of lovely produce, but then illustrating the work with other people uh, and how that coheres and adds value. And that's, for me, based on this proposition that if people have the right context to grow in, absolutely anybody can do it. It's all inclusive. But say in the case of Sheffield, if you want an allotment and you've got to first cut down a woodland and wait three years till the tree roots rot off, or, well, less than 1% of people are capable of doing that, because that's really hard work. But in terms of creating supportive environments where people can join in and sometimes just do the light or easy tasks, everyone can contribute, especially because everyone eats food. So it's, it is inclusive, sorry. <coughs> so yeah, this is a nice crop of garlic. It's slightly green still. I had the experience of lifting my garlic too late the previous year uh, when there'd been some rain and I was starting to get white rot in the root, in the root, in the bottom of the bulbs. So this I've lifted slightly early, and that again, observing the life cycles of plants, uh, if I'd lifted them a month beforehand, the bulbs wouldn't have swelled up, and they'd have sh just shriveled, and I wouldn't have got any crop to store. So it's making a judgement, these are fully set, fully swelled up, and also back to that moon thing, I've harvested after full moon. 
And that is a recommendation that comes down hundreds of generations, especially of European farmers, where if they lifted crops like onions after full moon, they stored brilliantly. If they lifted them before full moon, they rotted off and they went wrong in storage. So it's just by observation. Uh, I grow about a dozen different types of garlic. Uh, there's hard stem garlic. Some of these have got bulbs halfway up the stem. Some of them have got bulbils at the very top. But again, trying to acquire and grow on a wider variety as possible uh, gives you a better chance that in a certain wet year, some are going to do well. In a dry year, others will do well. If you just get some garlic from the shop, they will grow, but they might have been growing, say, in Egypt. So they might not adapt to our climate. They might have come a very long way and therefore not adapt well. And that's the same point about the onions. These we've actually dried off thoroughly first and especially made sure that the neck, the top of the onion, is fully dry before we uh, platted them together and made a nice kind of bunch to store. And that's another form of adding value to the crop. So if you've grown an, on an onion crop, you've got a month's worth of onions, but you could also store them for six months into the winter. And for instance, the price of onions will go up the later they're stored, the longer they're stored. So you get more value out of them by storing them through into the winter than by gobbling them all up as soon as they've grown, that kind of process. But adding value is part of the process. Here's the genetic range of the Incan rainbow sweet corn. So when we got them, that was on the packet mixed like that. But when we grew them, we found actually some of them are mostly red or purple, some of them are mostly white or yellow. And the explanation for this is, it's a mixed variety, a land race from Mexico. And in Mexico, they've got a seed bank just for maize or sweet corn. It's got 20,000 varieties of sweet corn in it, of maize. So each valley, each mountaintop village had a different type of sweet corn to suit their local environment. And this is, in the light of, that's a contrast with if the genetic engineering companies come in and say, right, we're all going to grow this one type of sweet corn across the whole world, it's completely the opposite suggestion. Because you've got microclimates, you've got variations, you've got different seasons, different latitudes. So what we've had in the past, and what we're still clinging on to to some degree, is this legacy of genetic diversity, which took millennia to produce, and the more of that we can hang on to and save, the better. So that's Incan Rainbow Sweet Corn, a bit of a poster girl for the organic movement, but also showing this stuff in the middle is the silks of sweet corn. Each tooth of sweet corn that you get on a cob has a little string coming off it, it's a tube, and that flaps around in the wind and waits until there's male pollen, and the male pollen has to burrow, land on the tube, burrow into it, and then it gets sucked down into the actual sweet corn head, the female part, to actually make a sweet corn. So every sweet corn bit has had that process go on. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> but yeah, that's wind-blown pollination. We'll come to that later. Here's what I call my pepper pizza. Uh, we've grown lots of peppers. Uh, some of them are ripe. Some of them we've grown some aubergines as well. And then this was the process in end of October of clearing a polytunnel. Uh, just to make way for the winter crops that we're going to put in afterwards, but made a lovely display. So I don't do enough of this, but I do a bit of tarting up and presenting things and making them a bit, bit kind of show-offy. Mostly I like them to speak for themselves. <laughs> this is the Earl of Edgecombe tomato. Uh, this lady's hands are relatively small. It's about four inches across this one, and some little yellow butterflies in the bottom there. But yeah, the Earl of Ed Edgecombe is the guy who built Heligan Gardens originally and his head gardener bred the best tomato he could possibly raise and it became named after the Earl. Uh, but you do get a lot of that, it's kind of, there's the ponciness of aristocratic kind of connotations and relative, but we, we, as a peasant I can get hold of that seed and I can be as good as the Earl or get as good food as the, the King or whatever, Prince Charles. This one is the pineapple tomato it really is six or seven inches across. One of the points here is, if we go for these flashy things, 
from one plant we might just get four or five or six fruits. If I grow one of the really small little dainty cherry tomatoes I might get half a dozen bunches with a hundred tomatoes in each bunch and generally you're going to get a, a larger amount of food from growing lots of small or medium things compared to growing just one or two specimen really flashy things. Uh, so again it's a balance if you're a commercial you wouldn't waste your time with this because you'll just get a few, you wouldn't get enough fruits to justify it but if you could sell them for 10 or 20 quid each or tart them up in some way to get the value out of them maybe then but yeah that's pineapple tomato here's a mixture of chilies uh, different chilies uh, that, that they'll all grow once you get them started they'll all grow fine and here's one in January I like to start my chilies and peppers and aubergines off because they need a long growing season so they're actually up and running as little seedlings already I use extra light and extra warmth to start them off early and then by April when they're ready to go up into a greenhouse or polytunnel they're just starting to flower so they've, they've, they've been growing for four months by April so that's chilies and peppers start them off this month really January, February and then other things like tomatoes they grow a bit quicker than chilies and, and aubergines so I'd start them in February or March and then things like cucumbers they grow so quickly that you start them off in April and by May they're big enough to grow on and, and grow bigger so that sequence uh, just think about the growing year chilies, peppers, aubergines, January, February tomatoes, uh, February, March and then cucumbers wait till the end of March or into April before you get them started uh, here's excellent aubergine plant I think they're really hard to grow they're a really fussy plant uh, the leaves will curl up if it's too hot or if it's too cold if you get one or two bugs on them but these are also illustrating the lovely bright shiny sheen on the fruits that's the point at which you eat an aubergine after that they go buff and get harder and after that they're forming seeds inside and the fruit goes bitter and also I've had the experience when I buy a commercial aubergine I actually peel the skin off because it tastes so bitter but when you grow your own uh, you don't get that bitterness and again if you, if you crop them at the right time you can avoid that so that's a bit of connoisseurship here's a nice selection of potatoes we can grow virtually any type of potato in this climate and most soils can be improved enough to get a good crop growing uh, some of them would be uh, more like salad potatoes like the pink fur apple uh, or the rose vial here we've got a few um, older historical ones international kidney is actually Jersey Royal and if it's got long enough in a growing season it'll grow up set one set of potatoes and then they'll start growing the same year and form an extra plant and they'll make two or three crops in one year if they get the chance maybe in Jersey they get warm enough conditions to do that and then let's have a look here's Golden Wonder what's the commercial significance of Golden Wonder? Ed you've just had some crisps crisps uh, so that founded an industry one variety of potato and that's because it's got a high dry matter content very flowery which means that when you put it in oil it soaks in loads of oil and then ends up really crispy crisps and the russet burbank next to it that is the only type of potato that M McDonald's use for their fries so if you've ever had McDonald's I hope you haven't but they're all made out of that one type of potato across the whole world unbelievable but yeah it's the same thing it's high dry matter content therefore it soaks up whatever flavours and oils it's put in with but all the other ones have also got um, yeah, their own uses big, big ones for bakers if you plant a big potato at the start of the year you will get big potatoes forming on that and that's like a store of energy that starts the plant off but it also tends to dictate which ones uh, how big the, the final crops are going to grow most of us especially if we're growing in containers we'd be better off selecting small seed potatoes uh, because we're only going to be able to grow small seed small final potatoes if anybody uh, wants to get some seed potatoes that's the Beanley's list if you can pass that around if anybody does want to purchase some there's a nice mixture there they will be selling out within the next few weeks but yeah, good, they're organically certified Scottish seed potatoes
alternative Sorry, OCA, OCA, which I don't think is commercially available. And that's what I've described as one of the future foods that at some point in the future, the supermarkets will catch on to it and find a way to present it to the public and then it might catch off when Delia tells everyone to buy it. Or, you know. But at the moment, it's unknown. That's um, a carrot that's grown nearly as big as my hand trail there. And it's not a perfect carrot. The side shoots here, the fibrous rooting, means that there's a little bit of damage somewhere down the root uh, and it's putting out side shoots to try and compensate. But yeah, carrot growing quite complicated. This carrot is the original purple carrot. Now, carrots originated, let's say, in Afghanistan, up in the highlands up there. And this is one which has been bred from those originals. A wild carrot is uh, about two millimetres fat and about a couple of centimetres long. That's what they started off as. Uh, this was bred to be a, a true pop, proper, it's per dark purple on the outside. The core, or pith, or marrow, is bright golden yellow. Now, they have come across, they've come up with a new variety of purple carrot, which is in the shops, where they've taken an ordinary orange carrot and bred just a purple skin on the outside. So it's what people are used to. So it's basically an orange carrot with a makeover purple skin on it. And it's no different in taste or flavour from regular carrots. But this one is absolutely amazing. The bit in the middle is really sugary. And, of course, like all the roots, they've got a concentration of nutrients in the outside and the skin. So eating the skin and the outside is good for you in nutrient terms. Eating the marrow on the middle is really sweet. But that is John's purple carrot, and it's the original proper purple carrot. What you've got now on the market, yeah, they look, they, they look a bit fancy. What is that one called? Purple Haze, like after Jimi Hendrix. But it's a, a fake. Uh, and so it's just normal carrot, painted purple, yeah. And here's a mixture of the winter squashes. Uh, let's have a look. There's Golden Hubbard. These ones are Kabocha uh, and Hokkaido, Japanese winter squash. That's um, a, a, a grey dumpling and Marina de Chioggia up there at this end. There's some of these, that's a shark's fin squash, which is a different matter. And some of these are French varieties, which would rather grow in the south of France than in our climate around here. But uh, once you get a useful one. That's a Kiwano. Uh, I grew some of these last year. It's a, a type of cucumber, which is more of a savoury cucumber, and it's got a, a texture like pomegranates inside. But they're stored quite late, and just for the weirdness of it and the spikiness of it, and it looks like it's come from out outer space, they're worth growing, because that's just about as easy as a, as a regular cucumber to grow. Here's a, a cauliflower blowing out. Uh, I have grown some cauliflowers that weigh about 15 pounds on the head, and my favourite is St George cauliflower, a heritage one, which grows through the winter as a plant and then forms its curd on St George's Day, 24th of April. And this period coming up, really April, May and June, there will be crops like salads coming on, but we'll have eaten up all last year's stored crops like onions, and this year's crops won't be ready till after midsummer. So this fills the hungry gap. So actually in the spring... Uh, there's less f substantial food to eat and the more things that we can grow that do give us food during that period, the better. That's one St George cauliflower. And looking forward to this, I'll be putting tops over my rhubarb crowns in the near future so that the warmth of the sun heats the air around the root and that encourages the shoot to come up. I've been doing this for years, it's forcing rhubarb. And the guys, commercial guys have cottoned onto it, so you will see more of this in the shops yellow leaf, pink stem, much sweeter. Uh, it's been uh, forced under warmth, under a cover, in this case just a bin, but that gives you uh, rhubarb that's sweet enough to eat raw. You don't need to add sugar to it. And if you do cook it up, it's nicer and softer and hasn't been exposed to the wind, which would make it more fibrous. But that, compared with uh, a, bit, a stick of rhubarb that's grown out in the sun and the wind and the elements, which will be later in the season, much tougher, much more bitter, Forced rhubarb, really go gorgeous. You do need to <coughs> grow your roots up for up to three years to make them strong enough to store enough energy 
to get this effect. So that this is basically last year's stored energy that's been stored in the roots that's now been used up without any photosynthesis uh, and that only when they're exposed to light will they, the leaves go green and the stems go darker. Here's a mixture of apples. Um, this is about 10 years old, this picture. <coughs> I used to use it as an illustration of locally adapted apple varieties. Um, there's some, like Keswick, Keswick Codlin, well that's come from the north of here. So we've brought it a bit down south. That will thrive if, even in tough conditions. A Codlin apple is a fairly wild form of apple, and therefore it will survive without much cultivation. Other ones are a bit fancier. Laxton's, that's a bit fancier one. That Lane's Prince Albert, that's the one we had at the break. But yeah, this was um, an, a, a mixture which we'd found growing in people's gardens and in old orchards and managed to identify. And a lot of them date back about 100 years when they were just introduced. Um, but yeah, the climate change story is rather than being restricted to apples from the north, uh, around Sheffield especially, where it's, slightly war where it's warm enough, we can grow the varieties that they grow in to the north, but also the ones to the south will thrive, so we're unrestricted on the varieties of apples we can grow. These ones have got a history of succeeding in this area, so they're a better bet maybe, but don't really have any constraints on the choice of apples. It depends on your site, whether you're on the top of the hill or down the bottom of the valley, that will make a difference uh, in terms of when they flower. But all those varieties will do well, and we've got, yeah, ones which have gone yellow and overripe already. Emnith Early Victoria, that's August starting. Other main crop ones, like King of the Pippins is a wonderful apple. Lord Lambourn, really good, reliable around here. And then all the way through to things like Granny Smith and Lord Derby, which in this picture have been picked off early and are still green. The Granny Smith could be stored right through till March or April if you've got the right conditions. And my aim is to have some that crop. I've got Beauty of Bath that crops in July. And then a sequence of apples, which I can eat in the autumn. And then other ones which I can pick off and store. So I've got apples stored right through till end of March. So I've got a continuous supply of apples for eight or nine months of the year. Uh, that's from having different varieties. Um, you more about how you store them. Yeah, the key thing for storing apples is you have to pick them two or three weeks before they would be ripe on the tree. If you pick them when they're ripe, then they don't store for any time because they're already finished. You know. So if you know, if you see by observation one year when that variety uh, matures on the tree, then the next year you need to pick them three or four weeks earlier than that so that they'll then uh, be yeah, in the right condition to store for longer. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, a little bit of detail. We did, uh, yeah, botanical illustration comes into this subject. I've worked with a few, and you can actually see the difference in the flower of what's going to form in the fruit. So there's Cox's orange pippin flower, nice dark red, but small flower. And there's Bramley seedling, which is a triploid, it needs two pollinators, but also it's got great big long petals, and it's going to form great big long fruit or great big round fruit. So yeah, you can actually, uh, again, studying every stage of the life cycle, you can learn something that informs you. That's when we did apple days and illustrated different varieties, and most of this stuff was second class fruit, so we juiced it. Great to juice. This is my best selection from last year, uh, some of which we've just eaten. So I've got about uh, 15 varieties, which at the end of the season, this is October, November, are picked off and stored in a cellar and eaten up during that period. Oh, mm. this makes me mouth water. That's a brown turkey fig. And if you've got a greenhouse or a sheltered site, you can grow figs in this country. Uh, they like, in the Mediterranean, they'd have three sets of fruit in the course of a year. We only get one really good set in the summer here. But yeah, that's waiting until the fruit is completely and utterly lusciously ripe. When you buy a fig from the shop, sometimes they wrap them in kind of spongy foil or something. But uh, if you can wait till it's just falling apart in your hands as you pick it off, and you have to get it in your mouth within seconds, that is the way to eat figs. Uh, waiting for them to be really, really fully ripe. And again, that's an experience that's really hard to get just from commercial supply. This is main crop raspberries. Uh, just a little point, 
uh, out on the allotments here I've recovered a yellow variety which I call lemon and an orange variety which I call orange mm-hmm. and they are slightly different but you can eat a lot more of these orange and ye- lemon raspberries because they're not as acid as the regular red and um, slightly bitter ones so you can eat more of them but they're lovely um, but yeah that's a whole revelation that you think of a raspberry as red but these yellow and orange and different varieties are even nicer than what we imagine, what we remember. Willows, uh, I've got a little collection of willows, some of which I've brought along this evening. If anybody's interested, uh, there's a mixture of varieties here. You can just stick them in the ground and they will grow. You could even chop them up and each shoot will grow. Or just stick them in a bucket of water and they'll root and they'll grow on. Uh, some of these are coloured varieties, like there's a, a dark black one. Uh, some of these, that's the longest, thinnest one. That's the one you'd use for bas- basketry, if anybody is aware or wants to do a bit of basketry. And these withies are one year's growth from established plants. So once you've got them in the ground and they're rooting, and you chop them down one year, uh, the next year the root has got enough energy to, to produce a shoot 10, maybe 15 foot long. I'll leave them there if anybody's interested in willows. There's different varieties there. And here's a little contrast. This is going on to think about sites. So this is someone's back garden. It's got a lawn. It had a big tree. And he's in the process of converting it into what we call an ediculture, putting raised beds in, a greenhouse, compost area at the end, and also putting fruit in the side beds. That's while it's in process. He's put a big pergola up. The more that we can use vertical space and grow things up walls, up into the air, the more uh, we're going to fill up a whole three dimensions of our growing space rather than just thinking about the two dimensions at ground level. Um, So the pergola is a good idea and we've got soft root against the walls here. That's the same place as it matured a a year later. So we've got soft root uh, loganberries and fruit trees trained up against the walls. Uh, Things like beans, hops, uh, squash actually growing up over the pergola. So That's a rare example of a regular back garden. But that's taken a couple of years of major work to get rid of all the old planting, dig out the tree roots. Uh, There's some paid work gone into this uh, for labourers, that kind of thing. And then laying out with railway sleepers, improving the soil, uh, so that there's a guarantee that the fruit and other plants are going to grow well. That's quite a big investment. Somebody has just retired. But again, that's the common, commonest situation, backyard, back garden, uh, and all these back gardens, standard large back garden, they were laid out in the 1930s, they had a plan to reduce the amount of allotments, but people still wanted growing space, so your garden was as big as an allotment, and all the council estates to the north of Sheffield, like Parson Cross, they've all got massive great big gardens, because basically instead of having a back-to-back and an allotment separate from it, People combined the two and had a decent semi-detached, but with enough space to actually grow around the back. So that is still there as a potential, but like I say, it needs all these Leylandii hedges and uh, you know, nonsense filler planting getting rid of properly before you can get things growing. Uh, here's upstairs at this building. That's Dave the caretaker, who's Jesse's dad, and he hasn't got any space, but he's, he's, he's got a roof that we've put containers onto. Now, growing in containers, we've got to refresh that soil more often than if it's just a patch of soil. So we have to bring in fresh soil, leaf mould, compost manure. Uh, But in the summer, it's absolutely gorgeous. He's got enough planters. He's got runner beans, peas growing up here. He can have a a little bit of luxury. So that's upstairs here. That's down at the Huerta, which Mick here is the coordinator of. And that was painted by Rolf Harris. (laughs) Uh, don't know why but yeah this is a specific opportunity it's a south facing wall and Renata that's where the lemon verbena grows ooh lovely I have to visit sometime and then we've also put in a peach and uh, an apricot behind these are peas growing up but yeah we've successfully grown oh and a fig so we've got peaches figs and apricots growing in the middle of Sheffield just in public and people didn't nick all the fruit did they we got some of the fruit off last year Mm-hmm. But that's a little project we're doing in the city centre. This was another herb bed, which we did really good soil improvement, and we planted these perennial herbs which thrive well on their own. That was planted up four years ago, 
We've never watered it. It's thrived continuously because we chose the right plants and we did proper soil improvement to, to make sure that they could grow well long term. Uh, this is over in Darnall, uh, where Zoe's next... Well, this is the Darnall Wellbeing Allotment, which was started as a community allotment about 10 years ago. And for 10 years, they, they, they muddled along. But they didn't really know what they were doing. And they never opened up the soil or improved the soil. So since I went there, I've been working there two years, one day a week, and done major soil improvement. So instead of looking bare, it's now all alive with plants in the summer and nice polytunnel in the winter. And happy people with... Actually, we've got too many courgettes and too many cucumbers there. But <laughs> and then here's another... Uh, supported project. This one is over in Shirebrook in North Derbyshire. Uh, uh, allotment project uh, basically for clients in care and it's laid out with lovely raised beds. <coughs> this pattern of having a main crop, in this case leeks, in the middle of the bed using most of the soil but edged with different herbs. That's perennial rocket, mimulus, uh, that's silver sorrel at the back there, thyme, um, a mixture of different plants in the one bed. And that's a nice way to combine perennial herbs around the edge with a main crop in the middle. Doesn't, these, it's quite a simple system, but you get best of both worlds that way. And here's one of the clients from that project. He liked the idea of having a stall. So he used to accumulate the produce from the day. And the practice is to yeah, pick off what's available that day and divide it up between people who have contributed and volunteered. So that's Mark with his little stall. And Ron, he done various things through the year, so at the end of the year we put pictures on a big board, added things like these are the straw flowers, helichrysum and status and some bits of grain, and he took that home and he had it as a memory in the winter of all the summer and the smiles and the activities that he's been involved in. Uh, one more here, this is over in Morley Street at the end of Walkley, and this is a typical old derelict allotment at the back with old buildings falling down. Uh, a project they tried to get going here put paths in the wrong way and then me and my mates came in and did three or four weekends Ed was part of this wasn't you and this was the young women's housing project we put them a polytunnel, we put them raised beds in we put an orchard uh, working with them and again that's still going three years later and they've just got some funding to actually appoint workers there so that's a site which has uh, kind of jump started to get the basics running, up and running and again, then the girl who coordinates it can carry on and she's kept it going for the last three years without any extra help. She's been on the course. And one or two more. This is a field out at Utebridge. So this is Alan, who used to be the head of adult education in Sheffield, that I've been working with for the last couple of years. He's got a bigger bit of land, about an acre. And now he's retired, he's got the time and any energy and the motivation to actually make this productive. But... If you look around any of the fields outside of Sheffield, especially to the north northwest, those all used to be used. They used to be small holdings or small farms, and that was often paid for by somebody who was working in industry, but the two used to work together. And now when I see all these fields that are maybe grazed, but are maybe just virtually derelict or just taking the hay off once a year, I can't think I can't help but thinking you could have twenty good allotments on there. You could have hundreds of people on that landscape if it was just kind of coordinated and, crucially, if people with the skills and the time and energy to actually use it are there. So that's branching out a bit further. And here's Paul. This is on Ed's allotment. This is what people are taking on on allotments. This is a 40-year-old willow tree. We've cut down most of it and dug out most of it, but it's still about two tonnes of trunk to move. <laughs> and the council come along and hassle this poor bloke because he hasn't done a good enough job clearing this allotment. But it's 40 years of, of dereliction, and uh, it's amazing that anybody's doing anything decent. But on the other side, we've done soil improvement, and we've just put an orchard and a polytunnel on that side. So there's a real contrast between the two now. Uh, one or two more, if we've got time. Sorry, I do overrun, by the way, <coughs> if you're after a bus. Uh, this is a nice plum tree. We planted now about 15 years ago on the Ponderizer open space next to the university. You can see it from the landscape from the Arts Tower. And these are the tower blocks down either side. And yeah, I'm also responsible for planting this woodland all the way around the outside of the Ponderosa. There was a plan, the university had a plan in the 1990s, to make this into a sports arena. 
because it's a natural bowl. The local community objected, they didn't have the money in the end, and we potted around planting a few hundred trees each winter for about five years, and then we waited 15 years, and now it's a forest. So that's, that's the forest that I helped to plant near the Arts Tower. And then, yeah, this goes off. Um, we noticed about three, four years ago, a lot of people have got lovely fruit trees in their back garden that they never actually use. And uh, arising from one of the courses like this, a few people met each other, and when I made this point that a lot, a lot of people have great big lovely fruit trees in their back garden that they don't actually collect the fruit from, we invented the Abundance Project, and that was to go around and approach people and ask to use their soft fruit, their, their fruit at the right time of year to redistribute it. It's gone to things like Shore Starts, to just display. But that gone to uh, you and yours, no, no, mm, you, yeah, onto Radio 4. And lots of more people have heard about this now. And so this concept of uh, valuing the fruit that's there has come about as this abundance idea. And it's a great idea because anybody can participate. Anybody can go around, pick up some fruit, eat some fruit, take it somewhere. Um, that is yeah, uh, a, a live and vibrant idea, which, again, this, one of these courses helped to start off. We also planned to do lots more fruit planting, and this is a pruning workshop as part of that project. So it was the love of fruit developing off in all these different directions, not just harvesting, but planting. And a lot of the fruits that people have got in their back gardens in Sheffield, at least, were planted after the Second World War. They were looked after for 20 years, but then neglected. So we can go back in and restore and find a good kind of shape and smarten up these trees and give them a whole new lease of life. Um, that's back to people with squash at Unston. There's uh, peach eating, apricot picking. Uh, lunchtime, we've got summer. Raspberries, strawberries, blackcurrants, peas and basil. And again, my practice is, I don't want to take this to the shop and sell them uh, to somebody I'm never going to meet. I want to divide them up between people I've got a connection with and I've only got so much anyway. Uh, so that's a typical lunchtime scene from one of my projects. And every now and again somebody even does a bit of prep, food prep. Uh, that's a guy who used to work for the National Trust who's come along to observe our seed t uh, uh, collecting activities. This is another project in Burn Grieve in Sheffield where they're having an open day and making a willow structure with everyone who's coming along. This girl wrote a little uh, PhD about community growing projects. This was the women's community allotment, which I supported in Walkley about five years ago. But that's wound up and been replaced by the young women's housing project. And then, yeah, also, I've had a, quite a nice time working not just multiculturally, but internationally with loads of different people. This is a load of Sheffield Hallam volunteers from Malaysia. And I thought it was quite funny or ironic that we were getting young students from Malaysia to come and help us do our allotments in the so-called civilised West. Uh, but they were good workers and they had a session doing that. The last couple of pictures coming up. And yeah, this is a group called People and Planet who ca came and helped do a bit of the Ponderosa a couple of years back. I think that's Ollie who came on the last course. And final picture, oh, it's me, when we won the Organic Food Awards with the Soil Association. And that is actually a picture of David, uh, Jonathan Dimbleby. He's very small, I never realised. <laughs> That's ten years ago now, thanks Ed. Um, I haven't any won any more awards because I didn't really value them. We went there as the only community group. Everyone else was either a company or from the council. So it wasn't really for community groups. But yeah. That was my little uh, claim to fame bit moment. I'm happier working with a couple of nice clients than I am going to London to pick up some award back. Mm -hmm. <laughs>